where you don't have continuity before, you still don't have it later necessarily. Okay. Questions about these examples? Okay, I think these ones are straightforward, but please ask if you have any. to essentially tell you something about composition and being able to pass limits from outside a composition of functions into a composition of functions. So passing limits through compositions. It's a working title. <coughs> Basically, it says if you have a continuous function, at A, so think about what that means. You can plug in A to the function f and you get a number. Also, if you take the limit of f, as x goes to A, it exists and you get the same number as when you just plugged it in. Okay. If you have this, And the limit as x goes to b of some other function g of x is a, then what can we say about this limit as x goes to b of f of g of x? So we we're approaching it from the left and from the right. This function takes that x and it, it sort of changes it, right? But it eventually narrows in onto this number a. Okay. What's this saying? This is saying, well, we're going to take x close to b, just like we were here. And this function, f, the outer function, takes as input the result here. This result gets close to a, doesn't it? So in a sense, I'm going to write this in air, not in air quotes, in real quotes here. This is kind of like saying um, the limit as g of x gets closer to a of f. I'll say g of x is y, right? Of f of y. If I said the limit as y gets close to a, right? And you know f is continuous today, you'd say I would just plug it in. Just plug a in for y, or for y. But it's not, right? It's g of x is getting closer to a. So what we're saying here, I think, is well understood, that we can just plug this in. We can just plug in f of a. In a diagram, We've got our x's, we've got our g of x's, and we've got our f of x's. We take x, we send it, we send something close to b. Our function g gets really close to a, and then our function f continuous at a, when we're taking the limit as this thing gets close to a, eventually just gets close to 
acclimating. This is handoff procedure and the limiting process as we go across this side, across the board here. There is mud or maybe I could give an example. Just passively soaking it in, I see, for the most part. We had this before, f of x, x squared plus 1. That's continuous everywhere. Just a parabola. g of x, let's take something simple here. Let's just do x minus 1. What is the limit as x goes to 2 of f of g of x? what this says is if this is continuous and we can determine what the limit of x going to of g is, then we can just plug that in. So we don't have to multiply things out. We don't have to plug this into that and just multiply it all out and figure it out. We could do that. It might be a little harder. What does g of x get closer to? What does x minus 1 get close to as x gets close to 2? This is a polynomial, continuous everywhere, which means we can just plug 2 in. So it gets closer to 1. So just plug in 1 to our original function f. Take 10 minutes, it's just check that that limit exists. We're good. Remember that this is continuous everywhere, so we're good. Apply the theorem, it's just that. Okay? Nice little helper theorem <coughs> for computing limits. Nine theorem. By the way, I told my told my oldest daughter the joke about counting you know, six, seven, eight, and nine. That joke. Why is six afraid of seven? Okay, right over her head, man. She didn't quite get it. And then I explained it to her, and she just told me it was a bad joke. So by the way, five-year-olds don't find that joke funny. If my daughter is represented, that's a sample size of one. If G is continuous at A, this kind of sounds like the previous theorem perhaps, and F is continuous at F of A, like that, no, wrote that wrong, G of A, then we know something about the continuity of the composition of these two guys at A. So then we know that F composed of G of X is continuous at A. So we think about what the previous theorem said. It said that we can pass a limit inside so long as we have the first outer function being continuous and this inner limit existing. If that inner function is always continuous at some 
you know, if it's continuous on some interval, well then, so long as the outer one is continuous at that output of the previous, then we certainly can pass the limit in, and we can certainly find all these limits via this previous theorem. Okay. So this is like the this is like the practical how to compute these things, and this is the theoretical statements. Generally speaking, when you have two functions composed together, what you need for the composition, which again is just f, with g of x as its input, so the output of g becomes the input for f. Um, the continuity of this guy is guaranteed if you know that this inner function is continuous on some interval, and then the output of that interval is also where this thing is continuous. So long as those sort of inputs and outputs match up, you're okay with continuity. So now the questions get kind of harder. Because to cook up examples of this that are not trivial, um, well, things get a little more complicated. So, first example is sine of x squared. And the question is, where is it continuous? inner function. What's g of x? What's the inner function? What function was plugged into the other one? x squared. Yes, thank you. And what was the other one we plugged it into? It was the outer function sine. Imagine if in this one you replaced every x with this entire function, which is just that, well then you get this. Okay. If g is continuous at a, and f is continuous at g of a, so we've got questions to answer. Where is g continuous? accepting this thing. This thing can only output zero or positive numbers. Right? So f, the next one has to be continuous at the outputs of the previous one. This one only outputs non-negatives, zero or positives. Is sine continuous at all of those? Yeah, sine's continuous everywhere as well. So it's continuous everywhere, including g of x for all x. So what do we know about sine of x squared? Continuous where? Everywhere. Awesome. Uh, next one. I kind of want to erase something. Can I erase this part too? Hang on, I'll change the function. We're good? Okay, the next one is natural log of 1 plus cosine of x. Where is h continuous? Oh boy. So what's our inner function? What's our outer function? I guess I didn't need these. 
right justified before, so I'll left justify them now. What's our outer function? Natural log. Natural log of? Okay, inner function. Very good. Okay, continuous, where, continuous, where, natural log of x. Where is it continuous? Don't say everywhere. It's not quite everywhere. Add a modifier onto that. Everywhere it is defined, right? Where is natural log defined? He said it. Positives. Natural exponential or any exponential looks like this. It's just an exponential in general. You can plug in any hex value for that. Logarithms are the inverse to this, which means you take this line y equals x and you flip this around that line, which means this negative axis here becomes this negative axis here, which means our function comes up this axis like this, mirrors this kind of like that, that's a log. So you, when you try to plug in a negative value for a logarithm, you don't get anything. It's not defined there. It's only defined for positive numbers. It's not even defined for zero. Okay, so this is definitely continuous for x bigger than zero. It's undefined everywhere else. One plus cosine x, is it continuous everywhere? Do we have to pair things down? What's the deal with this one? Well, this made our short list earlier. That's trig, right? That's just a trig function. So it's continuous on its domain. Cosine's domain is anything. Oh, spelling. Man, I wanted to. Oh, I swear. Learning cursive handwriting ruined me back in the second grade. That we don't was a, even teach cursive anymore. That was a failure of my Y into W, and then it really devolved quickly. Okay, so this is this is a non-trivial question now, right? Hmm. If G is continuous at X, so where is this continuous? It's continuous everywhere. Okay, and if F is <coughs> continuous on its output, oh, what's the output of this? So plug in any x to cosine of x. What can you possibly get out of here? So cosine can only output numbers between negative 1 and 1. Good. So what about g of x? We take all of these numbers and we shift them up by 1. So the left endpoint becomes 0. This gets shifted up to 2. OK. Is this continuous on that range? That's what we're saying here. Is the outer function continuous on the essentially the range of our inner function? No. Sorry. Natural log is only continuous and defined for positive numbers. So this is an issue, this square bracket on the zero. So from the theorem, we can say f of g is continuous on <coughs> All the real numbers except the ones which give us this zero. So what are they? And that will end this theorem and end the examples on this theorem. So where is g of x 
equal to zero. G of x is one plus cosine of x. You tell me. Hopefully you've made that table. <coughs> I'll take one example from each column, and then I'll be satisfied. <laughs> that was great, I've never received kind of expletives from like saying, you're going to have to tell me something. Oh, son. <laughs> where, where is that equal to zero? We're talking about angles. I'll give you a really quick, like here's a big help. Cosine is the x coordinate, so think about the angles that give us cosine equal to negative 1. This should be a huge help. Somebody can miss call. One angle. Three of these are like higher chances that I look at my guy contact and you give me a number. So what angle x is cosine of x equal to negative 1? Any old angle. No? 1 times something. No? 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 So we think about angles, think about the cosine. If I pick some angle, and I look at this coordinate, this is actually the cosine of that angle, and this is the sine of the angle. So we've got to create an angle that kind of swings around, maybe over there, right? What angle does that? You can use degrees of radians. 180 radians or degrees? Oh, thank you, okay. I got a little concerned. So we could have x equal to pi radians. Great. Another angle. Did you say something? No? Did you say Two pi. Two pi. Two pi. Unfortunately, that's this angle. Cosine is one. Okay? Try again. Three pi. That's this angle. And that's right. Next column. First guess. Do I need to ask somebody else in the column? No, they don't want to. More expletives. Okay. This is very positive. That these are optimistic columns. Okay, next rows, columns, however. Seven pi, okay, now that we've got this pattern going where it's just like an odd multiple of pi, no more positive angles. Yes? Three pi over two. Three pi over two. Mm. Three pi over two is like, <clears throat> we take this unit circle, and I would say pi over two. So that means you take pi and you divide it into two. So this is one pi over two, this is two pi over two, so we need to keep going. This is three pi over two. Unfortunately, that does not have the correct x coordinate. That's 0, negative 1. Another, another thing, just a suggestion. I was always going anti clockwise. What do your angles look like if they're clockwise? How do you write a clockwise angle? Negative. Okay, go from there. Anyway. In this call. Negative one over pi. Negative one over pi? How about just negative pi? Uh, it's negative pi. Negative 180 degrees. Yes. Which would be this angle. <coughs> yes. Also gets us there. Next. Negative three pi. Negative three pi. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, next call. And just yell it out. Negative five pi. Oh, okay. All right. Settle down. Oh, did I forget to call? I 
at a negative 7 pi alpha temperature. Yes? Okay, that was a long winded example, but hey, some of you needed some fear to motivate you. Maybe you were just overcome with fear. Math is just scary. I don't know. Hopefully, that was a comforting, comforting experience for you. Well done, everybody. Thank you for working that out with me. So, where is the composition continuous? Well, it's continuous everywhere. G is not zero. Well, we've just listed a bunch of things, a bunch of angles where G becomes zero. So this is continuous everywhere except plus or minus odd multiples of pi. There you go. Definitely not an easy example. Because if we plug in a odd <laughs> multiple of pi, whether positive or negative, to the inner function, we get zero. If we try and plug that into our outer function, we get something that's undefined. In order to get something defined, we need to make sure we map into this domain which means we have to take any other angles. Any other angle puts us into a positive situation here, which means we plug it into this and we have a result, and we know that this is defined, this is continuous everywhere it's defined. Okay? Questions? This brings me to 1227 and the intermediate value theorem. I thought we were going to be here a little bit earlier. That's okay. I've been talking too much. I'm going to erase this 4 to 2 if that's okay. Speak now or... Okay. So the last theorem of this section Before I come back to something I know I forgot. This is a very, very big theorem. It's used quite a lot. Sometimes abbreviated IVT, intermediate value theorem. If you think about what intermediate means, this is a very apt name. So let me first motivate it with just a quick graph. <coughs> Let's say I've got some function that looks like this, and it's continuous. If I take a look at like this value, f at a, and I take a look at this value. My axis wasn't tall enough. The intermediate value theorem says for a continuous function, if you have some interval here, so some minimum value, some upper value, if you have a continuous function, then picking any value in between there's definitely some input that gives you that. And so if I erase this and just put back the points, and I said, hey, does our function ever cross this line? And I said, it's continuous. That would mean that you would have to be able to connect this point to this point in a continuous way and you would eventually, you know, try as you might, try to avoid this thing, you would have to eventually cross this line in order to get there. If your function's not continuous, then you just cross it and then replace that crossing with a hole, right? But if it's continuous, you have to cross that line. 
That's the IVT. Okay. So in words, suppose that F is continuous. on a closed interval. So in this one, we're going to have to make sure, <clears throat> I said we wouldn't have to worry about this too much, but it does pop up from time to time. Being continuous on a closed interval means that as you, on the left hand side, as you approach it from the right, the limit exists. Being continuous on this right hand side means as you have this you know, end point here, as you approach it from the left, that limit exists. Okay, anywhere in between, you have to take both side, both side of limits. But at the ends, you just have to care about the left and the right limits, and then you're okay. If they exist, you're okay. You've got continuity on the whole closed interval. Okay, so where am I? And let n can we continue here? Be any number. Oh, this is really confusing now. I'll erase parts of this. And I'll continue here. Let n be any number. Between f of a and f of b. So as I said before, those are the heights at the beginning of our interval, the height at the end of our interval, and n is any number between them. Stipulation. We cannot have that these are exactly the same. It's really not very interesting. If they're the same, then we can't pick anything except the thing. And of course it takes a value. It takes the value there and there. So it's kind of not even an interesting thing. So the punchline is then there exists a C in A to B. And this is maybe not obvious. Where it crosses is definitely in between these two somewhere. It certainly crosses in between them. Why does it have to cross in between them? Think about that while I write this. Where f of c equals n. Okay, so again, put a point here, put a point here, connect the two dots with a continuous line. It has to cross any given height that you choose in between these two. It has to. This says that it has to cross, and that place where it crosses is definitely between A and B. A fun aside would be to uh, go through that. But. <clears throat> Intuitively, that makes sense to everybody? Yeah? Okay. So here's our best example, I would say. At least the best example as defined by the authors, Stuart, Clegg, and Watson. Let's let our function be some crazy polynomial, 4x cubed minus 6x squared plus 3x minus 2. <coughs> Show there is a solution. So we say we've got a function, which is this polynomial. Set it equal to 0. Show that there's a solution. Prior to this, you would have said, um, maybe I can factor that, right? And then use the zero product property to 
to show that some factor has a zero, so that there's definitely a solution. <coughs> now it's easier. Let's pick x equals 1, x equals 2. Kind of out of the blue. You could do this sort of thing as well if you wanted to pick two random numbers. You might, it won't, it won't take you long to guess. What's f of 1? What's f of 2? 4 times 1 minus four, 6 times 1 plus 3 times 1 minus 2. What does that give you? That's negative 2 plus 1 negative 1. Yeah? f of 2. 4 times 8 minus 6 times 4 plus 3 times 2 minus 2. 32 minus 24. What does that give us? That is 8, I believe. Plus 6 minus 2 gives us 12. I don't know what it looks like you, to you, but that looks like a perfect place to apply the intermediate value theorem. In fact, right now you know there's a solution. And you could give me a very good estimate for where it is. We want to know if it's ever zero, right? Zero is between negative 1 and 12. Yeah? <coughs> f of a is at negative 1. f of b is our 12. 0 is some height in between. <coughs> is this continuous? Yeah, it's polynomial. Continuous everywhere. So we're connecting, here's 1, we're connecting negative 1, here's 2, to 12. Connecting these two points, will it ever cross this horizontal line? It's continuous, so it does, and moreover, it, it crosses somewhere in between 1 and 2. So just the existence of some 0 is trivial with the intermediate value theorem. And what's better is an approximation method can be found here. You can approximate zeros now by adjusting once you've found things like this, positive and negatives, you can adjust the endpoints sort of iteratively, and you can narrow that interval down where that zero might be. So now you know how to program a computer, how to find zeros pretty quickly. Pick a language and go. If you can do it fastest, faster than anyone in the world, probably get paid a lot of money. So that's fun. Well, that can buy you fun things, I should say. Well, that's it for uh, 2.5. We've got about 15 minutes left. So now I need to talk to you about one thing that I forgot, and these are types of discontinuities. I was talking with a student in office hours, and it was apparent that they, they sort of intuitively grabbed on to what these discontinuity types are, but I just wanted to take a minute to talk about them because I didn't in any. So types of discontinuities. First one's called a removable discontinuity. Removable question mark. I suppose it's in the book somewhere, but that's no fun. We're going to leave it like this. Removable. A removable discontinuity as a graph looks like this. You take any old function, and it has just a little hole in it missing. Okay, so that's one type of graphical removable discontinuity. The other kind would be where it still has that hole, but the 
find somewhere above or below it. Okay, so there's two types. So one A is undefined at the hole, and the second kind is defined above or below the hole. Why are these called removable? Well, because in practice, if you have some function that has a removable discontinuity, it is very convenient to redefine a new function. So let's say this is our function f. It's often very convenient to define a new function, f prime, which looks like this. It's your original function, except where that hole was. And where the hole was, let's say the hole is at a. Where that hole is, you just define it as the limit of the function at a. And what that gives you is a nice filled in little hole there because you've replaced the hole with it, the limit at the hole. And now you've got a continuous, continuous creature. And you can do this in, any, in either case. If it's undefined, the limit still exists and it looks like it's where the hole is, so you just plug the hole. If it's defined above or below the hole, you just forget that entirely. Say, so who cares what it is there? Replace it. Okay? This is the first kind of discontinuity removal. These often pop up in rational functions where you've got division by zero, but it's division by a zero that you can cancel out through factorization. A good example is just your common x squared minus 1 divided by x plus 1. This has type 1a removable discontinuity at x equals negative 1. So if you factor this, you get x plus 1 times x minus 1, the x plus 1s cancel out. The remaining function is just x minus 1, which you can take the limit of. Very easily, right? And you can replace this function with x minus 1, essentially. Okay, so they often come up from the rationals. That's the point. Uh, the other kind is a jump. In your homework, there's this wonderful example of poles. And between a certain time period, I'll go with like 2 a.m. to 6 a.m., the toll cost is a little different than it is between like midnight and midnight and just maybe ridiculous 01.1 p.m. The tolls are different between here. I can't remember where the dollar sign goes if you write it in a single thing like this. Between you know normal times it's like this, and then it jumps up to this during this time, and then it drops back down, and then it jumps up, and then it drops back down, and it continues. These are called jump discontinuities, and I think it's for obvious reasons. Sometimes called step discontinuities. Uh, your book, I think, uses jump. Steps, because there's something called a step function, which just looks like a bunch of steps. Third kind is vertical or infinite or asymptotic. These guys, before we graphed uh, 1 over x, has a very good example of a vertical infinite discontinuity. Right at x equals zero, we don't know what this function is. Right? And what's worse is it goes down to negative infinity and then it skips.
skips way up here across this infinite distance, pause of infinity, it's like double infinite distance, and then it comes back down. So right at x equals zero, there's an infinite discontinuity, which is entirely different from this jump discontinuity, which is a finite amount, right? And that's entirely different from this removable. If I asked you to replace the values, you know, at these discontinuities, maybe you'd give me like the average. I don't know. It's a little more continuous, but still jump. And here, I don't even know what you would give me for the replacement of that function at zero. So, you know, doesn't really make much sense. So these are the three basic categories of discontinuities. There you go. How much time do we have? 10 minutes, perfect. So we're going to hop into 2.6, unless there's questions. give you some examples and some intuition here in our time remaining and not get too much into it. So I'm going to use this example here. Okay. We know that this means x approaches or gets closer to a, right? We've seen the tables of numbers where we, we get closer and closer to the value of a. If a was 0, then we're doing 0 0.01, 0 0.001, 0 0.0001, etc. In this section, we look at what the idea is for these things. trying to communicate with this limit as x goes to infinity. Well, graphically, you can think of it this way. Take the x-axis. What happens to our graph <coughs> as we just plug in bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger x values? So maybe you can reason through this graph with me. 1 over x. What happens to this ratio, 1 divided by x, as we plug in larger and larger values? That's what that limit as x goes to infinity means, essentially. What happens? Your line is closer to zero. Yeah, yeah. This green line is going to get closer and closer to zero. So we'll, we'll define it that way. We'll just say the infinite limit is zero. Because if I wanted to get closer to zero, you could just give me a bigger number to divide by. And if that wasn't close enough, I could give you or you could give me an even larger number to divide by. And you'd get closer to zero. So similarly, x going to negative infinity means we just look at this left side. And we look at what happens to the graph over here as we get more and more and more negative. 
the limit is again zero. Right, we get closer and closer and closer to the x-axis. Okay. So this idea, right, we're not getting closer to some number, we're, we're just actually instead thinking of it like this. What if x grows without bound? Common phrase for this. Right. Erase this limit and just ask, what if x grows without bound? What if this denominator just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger? We get basically nothing. What if x grows without bound in the negative direction? Same thing here. That's the idea of an infinite limit. Okay. So you could, I mean, with that, without a graph as well, answer me this one. What's the limit as x goes to infinity of x to negative 2? <laughs> Think about what that means. You said, aha, nice try, Mr. Love. That's the same thing as 1 over x squared. You didn't trick me. I know my power rules. I just forgot to write the fraction sign the first time. That's why I wrote negative 2. Sorry. I wasn't trying to confuse you. <clears throat> so what happens as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger? The same. What's that? This one actually gets closer to 0 faster. You looked like it was just too easy for it in the previous one, so I pointed you out. Wow. Uh, yeah. This one? Okay. This one's a little tricky. It's okay. You want to call a friend? Uh, yeah. Here's some power. Just point at any random individual and we'll ask them. <coughs> See, now it's his fault. All right, he's pointing at you, sir. <laughs> this is composition of teachers asking questions. Do I have, like, two minutes? No, no, it's, it doesn't take that long. What, what can you tell me about sine and what it can output? Okay, so this is kind of fixed. It's small numbers only. I'm going to divide small numbers only by ridiculously large numbers. Right, closer and closer to what? Yeah. That sort of reasoning is kind of just how you do infinite limits. Okay, there's some tricks that I'll get into next time to rearrange things to determine them in a more like algebraic way, but that's the basic idea. You just kind of think about Okay, I will see you Wednesday. Have a great time. As a preview, our test is coming up. Okay, so look at the calendar. The calendar is on Blackboard. And the calendar says next week, Wednesday. Next Wednesday. Thank you. You're welcome.